18, verses 1 through 11. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Come, go on down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand. And he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to him. Then the Lord of the word came to me, Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as the potter has done, says the Lord? Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At one moment I may declare concerning a nation and a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. But if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns away from its evil, I will change my mind about the disaster that I intend to bring on it. And at another moment I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it. But if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will change my mind. And the good that I had intended to do it will not be done. Now, therefore... Say to the people of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Thus says the Lord, Look, I am a potter, shaping evil against you and devising a plan against you. Turn now, all of you, from your evil way and amend your ways and your doings. May God bless this challenging word of Scripture. Do you have any hand-thrown pottery in your home? I see some heads nodding, and I certainly do. I keep it on display, even though only a few of my treasures regularly ever make it to the table with something in it. Whether they're useful to me or not, I treat them carefully and gingerly, washing them after each use and returning them to a place of pride on a shelf, like fine art. So when I think of a potter, I just naturally picture an artist. And when I hear this passage from Jeremiah, I envision the art studios that I have visited and the potters I have spoken to and the beautiful ornate pieces of art that are often displayed in those places. But in Jeremiah's time, the job of a local potter was quite different from the potters we might see demonstrated for us at an art fair. Every village had a potter, affordable, common, household containers, the kind that you might send home with somebody from a community meal, were mostly made of clay, and people went through a lot of them. The pots weren't fancy, and frankly, they weren't particularly durable either. In fact, very few of them have survived in archaeological digs. So for Jeremiah, a run down to the potter's house was more like a run to Target for you or me. We need some more bowls. John just broke another one. And off he would go to get something else from the potter's house. The vessels the potter made were utilitarian, simple, and made with a clear purpose. The potter was always at work, and so his sails remained steady. So at his arrival, Jeremiah sees that the potter is at the wheel, working with the clay. Something new is beginning to form, but it's a little off. Maybe the clay is too wet or not quite wet enough. Maybe too much pressure has been applied or maybe not enough pressure, but it goes wrong. And this lump of clay has to be reworked. The potter pulls it off the wheel, gives it a good pounding and a squeeze, and starts again. And Jeremiah gets a message from God. You remember Jeremiah, right? It was just a couple of weeks ago that we read his call narrative, that story where God chooses him, selects him to be the chosen prophet. We heard him say, Lordy, I'm just a kid. You need someone with a lot more wisdom and maturity than me for this particular job. And God said, don't tell me you're too young. And don't be afraid of the people I'm going to send you to talk to. So Jeremiah lands this official God gig, and it turns out there's a lot that God wants him to say to the people. For starters, God wants him to go to the leaders of his nation and tell them, 
They are horrible people and doing a monumentally terrible job in leadership. Then God wants him to warn the whole nation. Their communal life is so screwed up that everything is soon going to collapse irrevocably. Years of misery are going to follow for everyone. And Jeremiah is really sorry that he picked up the phone when God called. The scene at the potter's shed reveals something new, though. Jeremiah discovers an important caveat in the bleak message God has given him to deliver to his time. It doesn't have to be this way. It is possible that the future which God has revealed to him could turn out completely differently. The divided kingdoms of Judah and Israel are like that lump of clay, not fired yet. Their story remains malleable, but can still be reshaped to a different outcome. The oracles of the prophet, the warnings Jeremiah is giving, are like the hands of the potter hovering over the wheel. As the hand barely touches the clay, it applies just enough pressure that it can reform the clay. Through prophetic speech, God's purposeful touch on the world gives direction for reshaping the reality of our lives. We are created to be changeable, teachable, reachable by the hands that made us. And for at least a little while longer, Jeremiah realizes the future could still turn. It could turn out differently for his contemporaries than the dire predictions he's been delivering. But the kiln is fired up, and time is running out for Judah to avoid impending catastrophe that has already fallen on Israel. In the kiln, clay dries. It hardens in the firing process, setting up a permanent structure and shape. Firing also makes the pot extremely brittle and easy to break. But while it's just sitting there on the wheel, yielding, soft, clay can still be reformed. Do you remember the clay in that very first story in the Bible? How God shaped humankind from the clay and breathed life into our nostrils. In the creation myth, humankind is not rigid, and breakable, but made flexible and changeable. Scripture highlights the relationship between the created and the creator, which allows for God to continue shaping and reshaping us. God is still at the wheel, Scripture proclaims, assessing our weaknesses, building up our strengths, attentive to the character which is being formed. And when flaws are found, God works diligently to remedy them. We just need to stay soft and pliable. Now I'm guessing that your first thought is to take this metaphor very personally. That's our cultural bias talking. We are indeed a pathologically individualistic society. Every sermon I have ever heard on this passage in Jeremiah has directed the listener to ask, what is God doing in my life? How am I progressing as one distinctive and celebrated person? What is God going to do for me on the wheel today? The lump of clay we envision on God's wheel is a solitary, individual life. It's hard for us to even think otherwise. In our current worldview, each person is atomized on a separate Storyline. It's like a great big video game with over 7 billion characters in it, and every one of them plays the hero of the quest. It's how we've been raised to think. But the biblical worldview could not be more different. God's message is almost always addressed to people and the people, to nations and kingdoms, clans and families to whole cultures. Life is necessarily relational. So the shaping hand of God hovering over humanity at the wheel 
is very different from that of some complicated puppeteer pulling strings on seven billion separate puppets. God judges, directs, redirects, and shapes our life as communities of people. In Jeremiah's vision, the lump of clay on the wheel is not a single person. It's the ancient kingdoms of Judah and Israel during the time of the divided kingdom. Jeremiah was born into a priestly family and began his own time as a prophet when he was just a young boy. He was witness to the spiraling down of a once glorious national life and culture under the pretentious and short-sighted leadership of corrupt rulers. And the potter snatches the half-formed pot off the wheel and squeezes it hard to start it all over. Jeremiah feels the indictment of his people for their intransigence and unfaithfulness. It's not an individual judgment. It's a cultural, a political, a communal judgment. And then God moves the conversation from the covenant that God has with this one particular people and speaks of nations and kingdoms, plural, and we remember God is the creator of all of all. The language is reminiscent of that call narrative that we heard a couple weeks ago. God said God would pluck up and pull down, would build and plant as was needful and correct for God to do. Like the potter, God is free to redirect the creative process. If a nation or empire or particular culture has made itself great by Neglecting the poor and concentrating wealth in the hands of an elite, building privatized wealth on the backs of oppressed peoples, God will, Scripture tells us, again and again and again, in book after book, pull that kingdom down. Snatch the clay off the wheel, squeeze it hard, and begin again. On the other hand, God may change God's mind regarding destruction. And in response, repentance could bring a clear change in direction. One Hebrew Bible scholar put it this way, just as we, the unfired clay, respond to the potter's touch, to water, and to the wheel, so God responds to us. And so we see that at the heart of this lectionary passage is the complex interaction between God, the artist and maker, on one hand, and on the other, God's own people, who are like clay in God's hands, but are also so much more. God cannot make us do anything, she says. God cannot make us use our gifts or choose what's good, nor can God affect our conversion or direct our lives and our will to a new path and purpose if we will not choose those. There's a form of preaching called the Jeremiad. Most of us probably would think of it as an endless, pessimistic, demotivational preacher's harangue. Maybe you've heard sermons like that. Maybe you've heard them from me sometimes. <laughs> the Jeremiad is named, of course, for this very prophet, Jeremiah. Read his whole book and you'll think the name fits. But I want to rise to Jeremiah's defense and say there is so much more to his preaching and prophecy than doom and gloom. In today's text particularly, there is a hopeful vision and a deep love for his own people. The shape of our character and our lives is not predetermined and unchangeable. We were created better than that. Whether we understand that through the lens of individual agency or larger cultural norms, both personally and communally, we remain supple. We as individuals and as communities may be reshaped through thoughtful education, through the practice of virtues, where character may be deformed by practices of exploitation and prideful conceit. Healing can occur as we practice more godly ways of being in community life. Just as we are susceptible to temptation and corruption, 
we are also influenced by vision, aspirational thinking, and hope for a better future than the one we are now headed toward. The biblical metaphor from creation forward sees us as made of clay, and that does not just mean we have humble origins, but also that we're resilient and capable of astonishing reformation. There are plenty of contemporary prophets warning us of impending doom. From climate chaos to economic disparity, human migration crises to injustices against the oppressed, many a Jeremiah can be preached with faithful grounding in Holy Scripture. And we cannot look away from real and present dangers which face our nation, our culture, and our world. But we also cannot lose sight of hope. Hope is found in our created characteristic of changeability. The conclusion of today's election from Jeremiah has God asking the prophet, please, Jeremiah, go and tell the people and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, call them to a true conversion. God has planned an end for the kingdom of Judah. It will fall just as Israel has already done. But even this future plan by God is not fixed. It could have been otherwise. Like a potter still at the wheel, God is able to reshape and redirect this project and does so post-exile. But the clay has to yield. God asks God's people to return. Return to God. Leave the path of evil on which you have been walking. Return to lives of justice and mercy and compassion and faithfulness that you might once more live in peace in the promised land given to you by your loving Father.